see all those children up front here. It's probably the biggest group I've seen. Direct your attention to uh, Luke, the 24th chapter. Uh, each of the accounts is, uh, is very, very similar, with, uh, with, of course, some interesting differences. But each, each account covers the basics of the resurrection. And Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 9, which we've already read. Uh, let's, let's pray together. Gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the, again, the words, words uh, fail to, to express what, what really is uh, the, the order of the day. But Father, we also realize that this is not the first Easter. In fact, this is not the second or the tenth or the hundredth or even the thousandths. Lord, we, we realize that East, every day is Easter, and uh, it's just a matter of whether or not we tap into what the truths that, that we are celebrating here. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. As I was uh, listening, there's, there's so much to listen to and to, to kind of get, get, uh, get prepared for uh, a message today uh, on this, and, 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 and yet the, the messages are all basically the same across pulpits today, but, but, but yet we, we love to hear them. But as far as, as, far as anything uh, uh, very, maybe fresh or fresher, I guess you could say, um, I, I turn to some song lyrics. Uh, my singing voice is not very good today, but uh, we, can, we can recite some lyrics here. And this is, this is from a, uh, uh, some, some, some lyrics that you might hopefully recognize and you may not recognize. They all walked away, nothing to say. They just lost their dearest friend. All that he said, now was, and now he was dead. So this was the way it would end. Their dreams they had dreamed were not what they had seen. Now that he was dead and gone. The guard in the jail, the hammer, the nail. How could a night be so long? For morning had come, the angel, the star, the kings from afar, the wedding, the water, the wine. Now it was done. They'd taken her son, wasted before his time. She knew it was true, she'd watched him die too. She heard them call him just a man. But deep in her heart, she knew from the start, somehow, her son would live again. Then came the morning. Night turned into day. The stone was rolled away. Hope rose with the dawn. Then came the morning. Shadows vanished before the sun. Death had lost, but life had won. Then, for morning had come, then came the morning. Wish I could sing that one. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know if it's in my range or not, but definitely not today. Luke 24. We take for granted the starting of an engine today. It's literally a push of a button. But many of you remember, it didn't always used to be that way, did it? We talked about that at the sunrise service. I remember my dad's old tractor that... Uh, that and there was a specific posture that you had to use. You had to put one hand on the, on, the, on the radiator and the other hand on the crank, and the crank had to be just in the right exact position. And uh, yes, that's exactly right. There was starting an engine before electrical power, before or while the, the, the battery was dead or whatever, and, and uh, just wasn't maintained in the right order, but still you needed the engine running, and you'd, you'd put, you know, again, your right hand on the, on the radiator, right by the cap or on the corner, and the left hand on the crank, and you get that crank position in the exact right spot and give it a shove. And, and of course, that was just a little small four cylinder motor. Like I said, starting an engine was quite an ordeal. And even, even the old cars years ago, we, we were talking about this down at breakfast. How starting a car. 
used to be something, and, it, and, and, and I remember taking great pride when asked if I could start a vehicle. Tom, can you go out and start a vehicle? I'd say, yes, I can. I can go out and start a vehicle, because I know how. <coughs> we take for granted the starting of an engine today. It's literally a push of a button, but it didn't used to be that way. In a world where everything eventually grinds to a stop, instead of, instead of starting, everything is stopping. Everything grinds to a stop eventually in life. And, and like my dad's old tractor perhaps, or whatever, things are worn out and it just doesn't like, like to operate, and maybe you feel that way today. But Easter is that moment when eternal life starts. Easter, of Easter is about starting, not stopping. Easter is about resurrection coming back to life. So much is around death, uh, and, and so much focus is around death, of course, and, and that we usually associate with the fall of the year, and of course spring, when Easter is, is when everything starts coming back to life. As we're seeing all around us this morning, of course after the temperatures this morning, they might not be, uh, they, might, they, might, they might have a little more to say about that. But this wonderful morning, we join a group of Jesus followers and watch as their day, day begins in sorrow, but ends in victory. In a world where everything eventually slows to a stop, Easter is that moment when your life starts and never stops. If you too come to visit Calvary, if you too come to visit Calvary, well, first of all, as we look at the, the women and the, the characters in our text here, it, it, is, it is focusing on, on who came and who didn't. That's the bigger question. First of all, it says they came, and, and, and it's not, they're not identified till, till verse 10, where Luke, Luke says, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, they were defined a little bit in the previous chapter, verse 55, and, and we know that the chapter and verse divisions are not part of the text itself. They're added later on, but, so, but, but anyway, as we see it, it's chapter 24, verse 1, but they're not identified, at least on, on that level. In verse 1 it says they, they, they made their preparations, they were preparing to go to the cemetery most of the time and, and, and every other circumstance. When you go to a cemetery there is an expected, a predicted thing that you're going to find. Everything about a cemetery is predictable. And never in history has it been unpredictable. And these women went to the cemetery expecting to, to anoint the body of the Lord Jesus to provide that continual care to that decaying body with, of, of, of everything that they had come to expect. But we know that they, they came and they, as we, we, we discovered in our children's sermon that when they came to the tomb that it was empty. But who didn't come? Who wasn't there? Who wasn't, who wasn't on their way to that tomb in that morning, it was it was the man, it was the disciples. They were hid out or hiding out in some some undisclosed location. So much for the plot by the disciples. John twenty verse nineteen tells us the disciples were frightened. John's not afraid to admit that in his in his gospel. But you know, this is an emotional business. We all become frightened, don't we? People get emotional about their faith. And maybe you're one of those people that, that, that you maybe try or you know you need to talk about your faith. You know that the preacher's always hassling you about, about sharing. But you get emotional. And maybe you get choked up. <coughs> Tears start flowing as, as you start to share. 
And people get emotional in other ways. They get their feelings hurt. And sometimes we are guilty ourselves of maybe a careless word. Sometimes we, we hurt and we, we don't intend on hurting, but somebody still gets hurt. The disciples were, were emotional. They, they, had, they had made promises that they were going to stand by their Lord in, in, in this most difficult time. They, 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 the scripture tells us they had a hard time really grasping what Jesus was telling them because he told them on at least three occasions of what was going to happen when they got to Jerusalem. And they clearly were, they clearly heard his words. And just like, you know, women, you know, your husbands, they clearly hear your words. Right? But we men, even though we have to say we clearly heard it, we didn't hear it. And we're like the disciples, so we so often. But they were broken. They were crushed. Their feelings were hurt. Which is why they weren't there. Which is why they weren't there. Have you ever maybe felt that you disappointed the Lord? Disappointed God? Have you felt that maybe you've been a disappointment to God? That God maybe looks at you and maybe gets, gets you out of the corner of his eye and maybe shakes his head a little bit, just kind of, you know, touches his eyebrow, and then he moves on. Friend, you're not a disappointment to God. These disciples, they were not there at the tomb. They were not on their way to the tomb like the women were. Men, maybe you feel you've been a disappointment and not, not stepped up to the plate in your families, in your homes, the way you feel you maybe should have. Whatever the reason is, guys, it doesn't matter. There's always a new day. Today is a new day. Today is a new Easter. A new Resurrection Sunday. And God is not disappointed in you. The men got up and went, eventually, as, as, after the women came, and, and, and as Mary Jo mentioned, that, that Mary Magdalene was the first evangelist, or one of the first people to share the gospel, and, and the, 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 one of the first people to hear the gospel was the men, the disciples. But you know, this disappointment expresses itself in different ways. I should maybe finish, I should finish this thought. You know, some quit coming, some get mad. We see that raw nerve here at Easter. What about you? You have a raw nerve that's been exposed. Let Christ come to you. Give yourself time. You know, I'm willing to give you time. I've said this before, and I, I, it's, 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 it's due to be told again. You know, it took me 12 years to get back into the ministry full, full time. I was uh, out of the ministry full time for, from 2000 to 2012 when we unpacked our boxes in a little town called Stover, Missouri. And it took me 12 years to get back into, into it full time again. So I'm willing to give you time if you're willing to step back in the saddle. If you're willing to, to, to take it. And remember, let the disciples be an encouragement to you. You need to, though. I, I want to say this, is that there, there's not an unlimited time there's not an unlimited excuse in which you can be, be defaulted absent or be, be a, a defector. You need to get back on the bike. You need to step up. You need to take your, your role, your appointed place. Whether it's in the home or whether it's in the church or whether it's in some office or even God calling you to salvation. You need to, you need to step onto that bike again. 
and know what the healing process for Peter and the other men hadn't even started yet. The healing process for what these guys had done, and, or at least what they had felt they had done in abandoning their Lord in the most difficult situation, that healing process hadn't even begun yet. And they were forced to run to that empty tomb to try to figure out what was going on. Well, the women as they came to the tomb, they found the, the, the tomb was empty. As I said, every other trip to a grave is predictable. You know what to expect. Death is certain. But this was a unique trip, a unique visitor with a unique message. It was unexpected. They, they, they went to the tomb and they, and they found it empty and they did not know what to expect. Talk about a change of gears. Talk about a complete change. Here they went to the tomb with one mindset, and here coming to a coming and leaving it in a, in a completely different mindset. That's hard for us. Well, thirdly, they not only did they find the tomb empty and it caused them to change gears, but they were perplexed. The reality of death for all throughout time is one thing. It's the end reality. Death. Death is, death is the end. Death is, death is, is futile. It's futility. It's disappointment. It's ruined plans. It's this fearful thing that we don't want to talk about. <coughs> That's the reality that they were, that they were, that they were dealing with here. But their emotion about the empty tomb was because that was, what was the only, the, it was the only reality they knew until now. Now they have a new reality of life from death. And in fact, with the Christian, the Christian does not die. And that's the hardest thing, but the most important thing we need to learn from New Testament teaching is that the Christian does not die. We've got to get rid of this, of this mortality mentality. We've got to get rid of that. And instead have a mentality of life, of eternity. And eternity starts the moment we surrender to Jesus Christ. Well, lastly, they remembered in verse 8, and this is probably the most important thing, they remembered um, in verse 8, it says, and, and they remembered his words. All of a sudden it came to them what Jesus had been talking about, that he was going to rise on the third day, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day rise again, verse 7. Then they remembered his words, thanks, thanks, thanks to the angels who reminded them again. Unspeakable comfort comes from remembering God's word. Have you forgotten God's word in your life today? Have you forgotten maybe some of God's precious promises to you? And as a result, fallen into discouragement? You know, if you're discouraged today and frustrated, you've probably forgotten God's Word. You've probably forgotten some words that, that, that God has given you. you, you you've probably not been in God's Word if we're discouraged. Because once we remember his words. It gives us new life. Well, this is not a theological treatment of the events of this day, and I don't know if there is some, you know, theologians, of course, can write volumes and volumes on all of this stuff. But, but it's always a practical, as we, as we look at these things, uh, there, there's always a practical skin-on result of the miracle in their lives. Instead, this is about the moment, <coughs> excuse me, when everything starts, and never ends. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. Dear God, we pray that you would help us to remember that this is about when everything starts. It's starting that engine that's never going to end. Oh God, we just thank you for the comfort we have from the resurrection. In Jesus' name, amen.